Magic. Some are born with it, wielding themselves as a tool. Some learn the old ways over time or use wealth and intelligence to buy in. Others are not so lucky. Devotion to a deity or concept might grant you some of its power, but not all have the luxury of time and knowledge. Most aren't chosen even if they do. However, when you're on your last leg, there's always people with power and a need. Settle in, class. Today we're making me regret using copy instead of Patreon, because the warlock joke just writes itself. The warlock is a practitioner of pact magic, making a deal with a patron in exchange for power. Fey, demons, eldritch creatures, that's sort of sound. It changes the way you cast in a really neat way. Actually, let's just go ahead and get into that. You ready? Let's go! As a warlock, you're a full spellcaster. A little bulkier than most with a d8 hit die, light armor, and simple weapons. But what you're really here for is magic unlike anyone else's, because it's not technically yours. You're not a tap of arcane power with controlled flow into spell slots. You are a light switch, full power or nothing. You only have one to four spell slots depending on your level, but each of these is cast at your maximum level. And even better, since you aren't casting from your own power, they come back on a short rest. This means that how you play heavily depends on your party. If your party's full of people like monks and fighters, you're one of the best magic users around. But if your party doesn't care about short rests, you're gonna have to be more careful. And don't get too excited because your spells technically only go up to level 5. They use this mystic arcanum feature to give you the other four spell levels while restricting it to one each. It's also like that because at level 20, you're able to refill your spell slots with a minute rest once per day. I know that can sound like a lot, but it's actually really simple. You can cast like three spells, they're always at max level, and they come back on a short rest. After that, all your magic is cantrips, normally weak but free spells. Speaking of which, let's get this out of the way. Warlock, your power is great, some of the most fun, but it was bargained for. Your patron may have asked for service or payment, but the true cost is this. There are seven unique warlock spells, one of which is a cantrip known as Eldritch Blast. It's force damage, strong as a crossbow, and as you level, you can improve on it. Your Eldritch invocations can make it move people, do more damage, go hundreds of beats, slow the target. However, there is a catch. If you take it, everyone will act like you're the only one with a usual attack. Yes, the fighter said, see that guy? I shoot him every turn for two years. Yes, the wizard and sorcerer use Firebolt just as much. The ranger always hits with the same weapon, and the paladin burns most of her spell slots on smite, but for some reason having a standard option is only an issue if it's you. It's jealousy, warlock, or ignorance, or malice? Whatever it is, it's wrong. Use your Eldritch Blast, modify it, and have fun with it. That said, you can ditch it and use your eight invocations elsewhere. Get new abilities, improve other abilities, make infinite versions of normal spells, and whatever else you might expect from what's basically a miniature fiend. Just know that people will call you boring over Eldritch Blasting twice this fight, then make the same attack as every round of every fight the entire campaign. Anyway, other than your spells, your patron powers come out in two ways. The minor way is a gift at level 3. You can bond to a weapon, making it magical and summon a bolo will. You can summon a special, better familiar. You can get a book with three more cantrips from any spell list. Or you can gain an amulet that lets you add a d4 to a failed check a few times a day. You can get these from any patron, but you'll find the different warlock types often have preferences. Those types are the major patron difference your subclass. Exactly what sort of creature do you draw your power from? Let's start with the obvious one, the classic deal with the devil, the Fiendish Pact. This is the only one who might ask for your soul as payment, but souls are not mentioned once in the Warlock. I know people get confused, it's a classic trope, but not everyone wants your soul. Even devils can go without for the right price. Now every pack starts with a list of thematic spell options from other classes. For the Fiend, it's mostly damaging spells like Fireball, with a few curveballs like Blindness. You also gain temporary HP whenever you beat someone up. Really helps you survive, especially early on. That actually goes for most of your features. At 6, you can add a D 10 to a save or check, and at 10 you can gain resistance to a damage type of your choosing, both once per short rest. Note that you can even choose the mundane types that weapons use like piercing, though magic weapons bypass it so your mileage may vary. Always useful, however, is 14, hurl through hell. You choose a person and shove them into the pits of hell until your next turn, dealing 10d10 psychic damage unless they're a fiend. So it's the amazing utility of banish with finger of death's average damage. And there is no save, it just happens. Being the classic Faustian bargain, they really had to get this one right, and I think they nailed it. Mostly buying into your role as a blaster caster, but with enough support surprising resilience to cover for taking some stray shots. Of course, the question for this and all warlocks is who do you work for? Now, of course, this one works well with anything fiery. It could easily be reskinned into a fire elemental or red dragon. The resilience could be a fire giant boon, and honestly, even some angels work great. Solar deal fire damage and resist so many things they could just be sharing that with you. Even hurl through hell works through just casting the unworthy down to hell. But you don't have to bind yourself to the summer court fey just to spice things up. The fiends have plenty of variety. Arc devils hate each other and share their strengths so you'll kill each other's warlocks. Mol Warlock lets you do what you want so you'll go down to hell and help him get back in. Pit fiends change devils into better devils and they're just using their power to improve you too. And you can convince pretty much any demon to lend you their power to sow chaos. It helps their cults bring them into the material plane. Maybe Dagon's whispering you secret information, slowly driving you mad with knowledge no mortal should know. And yeah, Dagon's actually down in the abyss. He calls himself a demon lord, but he was there before the demons. The lord of the dark and depths being a Lovecraftian interpretation, of course. Which actually brings us to the next type of patron. Clever beyond comprehension with unknowable motive. Horror 
terrifying, unthinkably massive. It's the algorithm. No. The ocean. No. It's manipulative and evil. Capitalism. No. It's ancient beyond words. Your birthday was last week. Hey. It was a struggle to find that many candles. You realize the wizard is next, right? Call it a preemptive strike. Touche. It's the great old one. <laughs> it's the pact of eldritch horrors from beyond the stars. Also called the Gulak for short. And if you think that's gross, make sure that thought's yours, because it can speak into your brain in whatever language you know. This culminates at level 10, where you can guard against telepathy and share psychic damage with attackers. Your spells are all based on mental power and domination, and tentacles, of course. Just like the last ability, where you can charm a creature until the end of your next long rest, sharing worldwide telepathy. Jumping back a bit, your level 6 ability lets you give an attack disadvantage, then you get advantage if they miss. It's once harassed and a little out of place, but overall, I love how this class sticks to its theme. As per ideas, I mean, Guck did mention the algorithm for a reason. Like in sub, you made it this far after all. But, but seriously, being a YouTuber is trying to understand the system and went too deep. You uncovered an old supercomputer of times past. It injected you with nanobots and infected you with the internet. Those powers and spells were learned by accessing new websites or channels. Personally, I'd love to see one of those as a magical telephone operator or secretary. Your telepathy is just wireless communication or the intercom system. Hijack people through airwaves like a conspiracy theorist's nightmare. Turn those tentacles into telephone cables. Maybe you can treat it like when you go so deep into a hobby or fandom, it feels like there's no way out. Like it's clawing into your brain and rewriting the way you think. At first, it's just whispers of hidden characters and fun facts, but by the end, you're scarred with endless layers of Undertale AUs and MLP fanfics, or the knowledge driving you to power and madness was just engineering fundamentals and problem solving. At level 3, you went packed to the tome with the Engineering Standards Manual. Or you could keep it classic, go with Abolith or Mind Player influence. It's the Lovecraftian class, so things rising up from the depths to boggle your mind is pretty standard. However, that's not the only route for your undersea adventures or for tentacles. This is the Fathomless Domain, the ever venerated mystery of the scene. You become amphibious and gain a swim speed of 40 feet to plunge into darkened depths. You also summon giant spectral tentacles, dealing cold damage and slowing foes. And of course, your spells are based on water, storms, and cold. Also, Big B's hand turned into a tentacle, which I recommend for all your spells. And if you're wondering why black tentacles somehow isn't on the list, it's because you have it as your 10th level feature. You also gain an extra use of tentacles, you're bolstered with temporary HP when you use tentacles, and nothing can make you stop focusing on tentacles. Speaking of which, at level 6, you can reduce the damage for those near your tentacle by a D8. You also start resisting cold damage and can speak to anything that's underwater. And I don't mean naturally underwater, I mean you can communicate through waterboarding. Infinite tongue spells via drowning. You want to be near water anyway? At level 14, you get a panic button, teleporting the party up to a mile to the nearest body of water you've seen in a flurry of tentacles. They honestly should have called this a tentacle domain, but I guess people might have gotten the wrong idea. Or the right one, depending on your character and campaign and source of power. Krakens are the obvious source, but hacks work great with the classes by. Maybe your people venerate an ancient frog hemoth for their wisdom, or an abolith out of fear, or some tentacled beast from the far realm. You could just be a master chef, and the tentacles are from your cooking or strands of pasta. Maybe you're insect-based, and they're grasping legs or webs. Plant-based with vines or ghostly chains, but water-based is the classic, and there's a lot of room to work with. I mean, for starters, what does this even want? When my buddy Bittery wasn't magic like her sorceress twin, she sought out a deity of the scene. It offers great power, but she has to learn something new every day. He wants a pulse on the land's great knowledge. Your patron might be benign, or seeking out threats, or learning where to strike and who to tempt. They might demand sacrifice, or your hag patrons need ingredients from inland. Maybe they're raising you until you're strong enough to recover something hidden from them. They might be trying to help your noble goals because the kingdom you're saving runs on cold. The rising sea levels will help them take the coast. And speaking of dragging up from the depths to terrorize the coast, the Undying Pact. It's the undead version from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, and the Skag's name alone terrorizes some with its mediocrity. I actually enjoy some of the Skag classes, but, well, the haters can't always be wrong. The spell list is death-themed, of course. There's a few odd bits like legend lore and silence, but they mostly just grabbed anything that had death or disease implied. You also get advantage on disease saves, and if an undead who you haven't tried to hurt is using a single target attack or spell, they have to make a save or target someone else instead. If they do make the save, or you attack them, they're now immune. That's uh, about as useful as the level 10 ability, where you don't need to eat, sleep, or breathe anymore and age at 1 tenth rate. You know what is fun? Getting to recover 1d8 plus level health and reattach limbs. Less great is using it once per short rest at level 14. I'll be real, the only cool ability you get here is level 6. When you succeed on a death save or stabilize someone with Spare the Dying, you are gain a d8 plus con health. That lets you bring yourself back from the bring of death, but only once per day. If your DM's gritty enough to be lopping off limbs, you're not gonna make it to level 14 with this class. You get an undead theme, but nothing active, and it makes you more durable, but not by much, and you don't have anything to do while close anyway. I'm tempted to rework this or skip to the next pact, but I guess this is the perfect place to ask the universal question. Why did you take this pact? Did an undead offer you eternal life, or a place underneath them when you failed to slay them? Did you become a serpent to save your village, or needed revenge and only they were willing? Perhaps you packs with someone else to survive a zombie or mummy curse. The patron's power is just stopping you from dying, and your power is the parts getting through. And of course, this goes with the rest, too. Why did you think that binding yourself to the king in yellow was a good idea? Are you just wanting the world to burn, or do you think you can do more good with your power?
power, then that'll do bad through you. Does the devil have your sister's soul and you traded yours for hers? So why isn't just important from a story perspective, not just one of the most interesting parts of your entire origin, it's one of the first things your party will ask you. Right after, why didn't you just pick Undead Pact? Forget about the power, it just does the Undead flavor so much better. I mean, yeah, the spells still feel like they just grabbed anything with death in the description, but your starting ability is Form of Dread. You turn into an aspect of your patron, gaining temporary HP, fear immunity, and spreading fear when you hit people. Hey, look, something to actually do with that survivability. And each ability grants extra effects in that form. At level 6, you can make your attacks do necrotic damage, but they do even more damage in the form of Dread. At 10, you gain necrotic resistance or immunity in Dread. You can also just refuse to drop to 0 HP and explode with necrotic damage instead. Be careful with that though, because it takes 1d4 days to recharge and exhausts you. Still, much better than the expected result of blowing yourself up. You can also scout ahead with your level 14 spirit projection. Your soul leaves your body and can run around for an hour. And don't worry about hiding your body, just shove it in your bag of holding. You haven't needed to eat, sleep, or breathe since level 6. You can still take damage and die, but you resist normal weapon damage, cast spells without using most components, fly and walk through walls, and while in form of dread, you can heal for half the damage of an attack. And if you ditched your body somewhere, you can warp to it or it to you when you're done. Only once per day, but it's still really cool. I mean, it's hard to get more undead flavored than literally becoming a ghost. Though that does make reflavoring really hard, since not much can walk through walls. You can at least change your dread form to say more about your patron. Turn your limbs into their limbs, have their spectral form hover beside you. Maybe they can see and hear you like this, and does your character know? You might hate using this form because you don't like it learning about your life and friends. You could change this to a spirit of the land, a manifestation of rotten decay, a form of death's place in nature instead of undeath's fight against it. But death is pretty entwined in this one. That's fine though, it can be a sign of quality if you can't revive easily. It means they actually committed to the bit, and come to think of it, what happens if you aren't? This is more for the DM, but what if your player just ignores the patron? Do they eventually annoy them enough to lose their powers? Perhaps the patron possesses them, or they start gaining exhaustion, or take daily damage like the Geos spell. They might just start getting debuffs, or get warped back to their patron. Maybe the secret is that they can't take the power back, but suddenly you have other powerful allies bearing down on them to kill or capture. I know I don't usually advise combative DMing, but I am all for actions having consequences. I'd give them warning since they're a valuable asset, but if they chose to use then betray an arc devil or a lich or god, then they're going to learn what happens when they don't stay in their weight class. After all, as we learned from the most well-known melee warlock, there's farming equipment that outranks you. The Hexblade has you working with a sentient magic item. Yeah, some are so powerful they can basically manifest multiples of themselves. And don't worry, they're not expecting you to rush into a brawl with a short sword and a dream. Your spells are all focused on combat, mobility and damage and avoiding damage. You get medium armor, shields, and can use martial weapons. If your weapon is one-handed, you can also bind it to yourself. You can then use your charisma instead of your strength or dex. And this works for all your conjured weapons if you choose Pact of the Blade at level 3. And I'm gonna be real, you probably want to do that since it lets you conjure better weapons or dual wield. There's also an invocation that lets you use a bow if you want to go archer, just saying. Anyway, you can also hex people once per short rest. You'll crit them easier, do more damage, and heal a bit when they die. At level 10, you can give that cursed person a 50% chance to miss you too. You are pretty much made to kill bosses, at least until level 14 where you can make the hex bounce to another creature after they die, letting you rip through minions. Level 6 is your non-hex ability, binding souls of slaying bows and making them bite their friends. You make a slightly more durable specter that follows your commands until you rest. That's, uh, kinda messed up. Like, there's nothing else here that's evil unless you count the cursing, but you can just flavor that as being super focused or raging or something. It's basically just a modified version of the Ranger's Hunter's Mark. I mean, I guess you could flavor it as Artemis giving you a temporary companion as a reward for a good hunt? I don't know, there's not much you can do to get around this being messed up. Here's a question though, do you think the Hexblades lean towards edginess because they're upset they were less magical than a stick they found? Like, you know that some of them have to be bitter that a steak knife had more magic than them? More importantly, what does your angry frying pan even want? Do they want to fry the flesh of more creatures and you're an easy way to do it? Do they have a grudge against their smith or the god that formed them? Are they a tool that lived long enough to gain a soul? Or did someone use and care for them enough they started to copy their personality? Maybe the previous owner lives on inside their tools of the trade. Are you just there to fulfill desires they no longer can? Maybe they link minds to peel the breeze on their skin again, if only for a moment. It could be some poor grandma or hyperactive kid who misses being alive. Or they're a collective of everyone who came before you whose only goal is absorbing your kills and eventually you too. I like to think of them as kind of like an egg. Those massive artifact level items are all different forms of the same base materials or creatures. You have a shard, this larval form, basically embedded in you. As you adventure, it inhabits new weapons like a hermit crab. Until eventually you die and it uses your body as a catalyst to fully form. Maybe you are dead, but it wasn't ready, so the person who's speaking is actually the weapon piloting the body and keeping it aligned. Let's just hope you don't run into people from their past who might spot the difference. A fear that's all too familiar to the patrons of the Archbay Pact. Look, we gotta remember one of the original bad decisions. The Hexblade's a bad decision because you're taking orders from a soup spoon. The Fae will mess you up as a party game. You start off with utility spells. Sleep, dominate, invisibility, the stuff that helps but mostly does no damage. Continue
Continuing that, you can charm or frighten creatures for a round if they get too close once per short rest. That mostly helps in early game, but by level 6 you'll usually default to Misty Escape. It's Misty Steps Teleportation, but also makes you invisible. It's only once a short rest, but you usually won't need it much more than that anyway. At 10 you become immune to charm and can actually reflect them back at the caster. You'd be surprised by how few things with charm abilities are immune. The Beholder will probably charm themselves by accident at some point, and at level 14 for one minute you can make someone see only you. The world falls away, no sight, no sound, just you and the Misty Void. Don't underestimate it, it's a terrifying feeling. I would know. Um, anyway, a little underpowered by modern standards, I'd up some of your weaker abilities to proficiency times a day, but it's still barely solid. A fifth of all monsters are immune to charm, but that's what spells and your friends are for. As for flavor, I mean, there are tons of fae to choose from. Make the queen of anything from mean lock to giant hydra geese. Strides and naiads and pixies are classic, hags basically go without saying, and that's not even getting into all the named ones. Maybe you just got really messed up at a satyr party and came back as part of the fraternity, drunk and oath to boom. But with fae especially, remember the terms of your agreement. Maybe the satyrs demand the spread of their debauchery, or the redcaps demand blood, and the little house may have a strict set of hospitality roles they expect you to follow. The queen of the fairies might yank you back to her place to act as a servant in your dreams, using you as the court's entertainment. Whenever you level up, you disappear for five seconds, but it was years in your time. One of my favorite people is a Feylock, a dear to I've known for much of my life. Her dumbass parents got a fake queen to bless their child with being beloved and beautiful, then mocked her in private for being so easy to work. The fae couldn't go back on the blessings, but showed them how easily they could backfire. The girl grew up to be the sweetest and most kind-hearted soul, who eventually found the Fane Lake and broke down crying. Her parents could barely fend off the army of horrible suitors, and there was no way her spine was surviving much longer. Her species moves by jumping. She swore an oath to always try and help people and do good things to the best of her knowledge, if only they would grant her relief. The Fae felt pity and accepted, complete with thaumaturgy peel magical girl transformation and a fitted bag of holding. Unfortunately, she's dumb as rocks and has trouble understanding what good and people are. How come these dragons are people and these ones aren't? Maybe that one's tail flick is sign language you don't understand, or that one isn't speaking and you're lying to me. She mostly gets it right from dumb luck, but it causes her fairy godmother so much grief. Cause in her little crayon notebook, she's decided people have names and clothes and stuff, but a title isn't a name. So a dressed up dog named Fred might be a people, but if that's just a guard, all bets are off. But she's technically not breaking contract when she ties up and robs that villager, cause she is genuinely trying to do good. Sometimes your magical girl is just an airhead. But speaking of doing good, thanks for sticking around for the story by the way. There's more to it, but I didn't know where else I could share this and I've been friends with her for like 11 years. But Speaking of good, Celestial Warlock. Why spend your life in undying devotion for a tiny chance you get something in return? Just be an employee and get the powers guaranteed. Your spells are healing with some radiant and fire damage, plus the light and sacred flame cantrips. They might not be the most useful ones, but if you don't want to focus on upgrading Eldritch Blast, then sacred flame is a great substitute. Especially at level 6, where you add your charisma modifier while dealing radiant or fire damage. Also at level 1, you get a bunch of D6s that you can use to heal people as a bonus action from 60 B. Your raw numbers aren't going to outheal a cleric or something, but getting your level plus 1 in free healing words spells is amazing. At 10th level, you and the party get temporary HP when you rest, and at 14, it's hard to make you stay down. Once per day, instead of making a death save, you can heal to half, blind all enemies within 30 feet, and do a bit of radiant damage. There's also no save on that, they're just blind. Now I am a bit biased towards it because I love the flavor, but it does leave me wondering, why Sacred Flame? Why not just make your Eldritch Blast radiant? Come to think of it, why doesn't every patron modify the blast? The Fiend is Fire, Old One Psychic, Fathomless Cold, etc. Anyway, the first thing people are gonna wonder is, what makes you different from the Cleric? Well, for one, you're not always chosen by fate or even devoted. Now, you could be devoted, and I can actually see these warlocks as being more trusted than the cleric. A cleric can go corrupt or start hating the god or secretly be drawing their power from a different god. When the cleric stops doing the god's work, they still keep their power. But with the warlock, regardless of why they're devoted, you know they have to follow the terms of that specific god. And not some biased interpretation of old text, they have clear and direct instructions that are always being updated and they are being monitored and reprimanded. Finding yourself in service like this might be seen as a high honor, though you might see them as no different than any other power from magic creature. Maybe this really is just a job or a means to an end, and you're willing to work for them for the power to do what you really want. You also might not have made this with a god. Maybe you saved a minor archon, garnered favor with an animal lord, gained the affection of a unicorn. Maybe it's a fallen angel who's granting these powers, and really you're more healing based than celestial based. There are dukes of hell that have healing, and even Lolf can grant it. Maybe you made a pact with the sun, or the core of the plane of fire, or you're worshipping what was essentially a nuclear strike. You're some sort of mutated animal or plant and owe it your sentience. And to the alarm of everyone around you, the pact of service
service you offered actually went through. Nobody knows who accepted that pact or what it wants to do. And speaking of someone suddenly gaining power from a mysterious entity due to what people thought was just a wish upon a star, it's genie time. Not gonna lie, this one's probably my favorite. If you watched the druid episode, you know I have a history with half genie heroes. Since you're getting your power from an elemental genie, you have two sets of spells. Half comes from the elemental portion, like burning hands or wall of stone, and half comes from the genie part, like creation and wish. But forget about that, you still need to pick your symbol of office. As a reversal power play, now you're the genie in a bottle. A lamp, jar, ring, statue, it's what you're bound to and what you focus your cast spells through. While touching it, you can add extra damage of your genie's element to your attacks. You also resist that element at level 6 and learn to fly in 10 minute chunks. At level 1, you also learn to enter your object. It's a 20 by 20 cylinder on the inside, a little room for you. Modestly furnished, comfortable temperatures, and you can hear what's going on outside. It's great for sneaking into places, resting in places others can't follow, and just being kinda cool. If it gets smashed or stolen, you can get a new one during your short rest, and it kinda acts like a limited pack of holdings since your items stay in there. At 10, you can bring others inside with you, take a short rest in the span of 10 minutes, and make Yield Hit die much more potent. I'm always hearing about tension between classes over short rests, but not with this one. Anyone who needs one can just hop in your bottle, and the people who don't just keep moving. Or you can wait till the end and have everyone stay in there for a safe long rest. And at 14, you get Limited Wish. I miss this so much. Limited Wish lets you cast any spell of level 6 or lower for free, though it has to be an action and does take a few days to recharge. However, within those bounds, it can be anything you want, and note that there isn't a cost. If the spell consumes a thousand gold worth of rare components, not your problem. I put the genie last because this, to me, is one of 5e's pinnacle examples, not just of warlocks, of class making in general. Bits that change to be custom to your character, really flavorful abilities that directly impact your playstyle, things that you can do that nobody else can. It's solid as a base, fantastic with creativity, and that is exactly what I'm looking for. And this really focuses on something that's there for every class. What is your relationship with your patron? Are you related or a favorite servant with unlimited freedom? Did you appeal to their self-importance and offer them a reverse of the usual setup. Humans keep finding them to service, so keeping you around as a status symbol or pet is incredibly appealing. And for all patrons, maybe you just share similar goals. You didn't save a Celestial, you just found one whose goals aligned and they respected you. You approached a company with a business presentation and the board agreed to your proposal, turning you into Undying Domain. Undead Domain's the promotion you're after. Maybe you're just a little scamp and some pixies like your style, turning you into a mascot and just letting in loose. You gained favor with every satyr at a party and they agreed to help you out so you would keep coming back. Sometimes you took the deal because it's genuinely good for both of you. Remember, after all, despite common belief, they don't don't have to take your soul. What they get out of it could just be entertainment, their agenda pushed, being family, favors, thinking you're hot, it doesn't have to be malicious. So whatever you want to do, I hope I cleared up some misconceptions about warlocks and got a few of you interested. Sorcerer, warlock, alchemist, druid, which one's my favorite class to play honestly just depends on the day. But if you're not a fan of the flavor this class is dripping in, a couple recommendations. If you want to lean into the magical side, the sorcerer also has spells you can modify. And the paladin or ranger is great if you're wanting that melee magician. Though honestly even the specialized classes have at least one subclass that's a melee caster so you could just check out the nearly finished class list. That feels really weird to say. I'll probably finish this on the channel's two-year upload anniversary. Kept going with equipment funded by the lovely Feral Goblin, Snake Oil, and Modern Masquerade. Thank you so much as always, and also to the rest of you. I'm finishing this script on my birthday, and it's been a wonderful two years with you. Thanks for all the views, the comments, the general support, both past and future. See you with the wizard, I guess. Then, who knows what. Class dismissed. And thanks to you three too. You got it, boss.